This is The Close-Up, conversations about creativity. From our studios in Los Angeles, here is Jim Chabin. Guido Votolina is here. He is the head of presence capture for Nokia and Ozo, the company's new virtual reality camera. He is based in Sunnyvale, California. Welcome, Guido. From Nokia's standpoint and from your own background, watching so many new technologies launch, uh, what excites you about VR? Well, the exciting part of VR is, is this fundamental difference on, on the picture. We grow up with the picture being a rectangle. Uh, 16 by 9, 4 by 3, uh, but all our life, either camera picture or movies, uh, were just a rectangle. And now suddenly that picture is spheric. It means that uh, it doesn't almost matter which media you use to consume it. Uh, the assumption is that you can go right, you can go left, you can go up, you can go down. You, you just immerse. So that's, that's a big thing because open up uh, all kind of new venue and first of all, of course, being immersed. You can be in a different environment or place. What are the things that you look at and say, that's terrific, I, I, would, wanna, I would want to enjoy this? When you're in a virtual reality experience uh, and your emotions are triggered, then that means something is happening that captures your attention. It's not only visual, but it's way more than that. Uh, and you feel immersed, uh, not technically immersed, uh, picture everywhere, but you emotionally immerse. Uh, start thinking about what is happening. I buy iTunes all the time and download yeah. my song. If someone says, and Paul McCartney's made a VR That's right. video, That's right. but if I could download something of Paul McCartney doing one of my, yesterday, <laughs> in one of his concert, would I download it and watch it VR? So does that seem to you to be a solid financial kind of series of steps that a lot of business people can look yeah. at and say, this can be a business here. Yeah, I think that, that that is kind of the early early stage approach uh, where you say, okay, instead of the traditional camera, I put a VR camera and suddenly everybody can be in the first row or even on stage. Uh, and, and by the way, cameras can be multiple in VR too. You, you don't have to select just one okay. location. Right. You can have multiple and people can you know Switch. move around uh, uh, in different point of view, of course. Uh, uh, but there is a one more step uh, uh, that is referring to this concept of first row seat uh, as you were referring for the Lakers game uh, or music uh, and then suddenly it can be your additional element uh, in your normal experience let me explain that uh, you can watch a concert live on TV you know and you pay the channel to to watch it and maybe you like to go to the concert I don't like to go to the concert I like to watch the concert at home so I don't have anybody pushing me and you're enjoying you know, the crowd there and just being there and fantastic. The best things we can do is exchange text or Facebook messages uh, saying, hey, I'm here, I wish you were here and join this. And I say, no, I wish you were here <laughs> and we'll be on the couch and so on. But now suddenly I can, in my couch, uh, wear a goggle and I can look around and see you there and I can experience part of what you're experiencing. I still enjoy my show through TV, right. and I'm not gonna watch the whole, you know, the whole concert through the, right. but this element of, uh, what, that's what we call, uh, you know, space element uh, as a space machine. I'm, I can be there and not be there at the same time. That's fantastic. No one in Hollywood, none of the serious production people, whether they're in the music or sports or anywhere yeah. else, can conceive of taking this much further without a professional grade camera. That's right. That's what you've been working on. So tell us the story. It's called Ozo, and yes. we're going to show some pictures here. Tell us the story of Ozo. Well, Ozo, um, I mean, the story started really two years ago in the labs in Finland uh, at Nokia Technologies. Uh, and, and the inventors really look at a blank sheet of paper saying, okay, we're making a camera for virtual reality. This is not a camera or using cameras that are existing and adapting them for virtual reality. This is a new project uh, and we're looking at the best way of doing it uh, professionally with professional grade uh, as a dedicated camera for VR. How many lenses? Uh, eight. And do they capture the complete 360 degree Yeah, picture? in 3D. Does the ozone system have the back end handles so that the people who are not only shooting it can then go 
manage the creative process of making the uh, the end product? Yeah, that's a great great point. Uh, uh, so the whole workflow of production is changing, and of course, the need to adapt uh, to the VR, uh, starting with the camera itself. So those eight cameras, 2K by 2K, is you know a lot of pixels, a lot of data, and one of the problems solved by the R&D team is how to synchronize those eight cameras and have one single cable that brings all the data out right away. So that's, that's already a big step. And then this cable has to go somewhere, either is post-produce or live produce for you know, live, uh, live production, has to go into another step uh, where the real post-production happen or production happen. And you need tools that allow you to see every single camera on its own or all together and all in real time. Because in particular, if you're producing video live, uh, you, you can't wait uh, or you, you don't have time. You just need to do it right away. So we have a, a software that goes with, with the camera that allow people to see exactly what the camera is, is seeing and what you eventually want to put, let's say, on air or over the top uh, using a, a modern terminology. But you're just streaming uh, to, to, to the world. What's an ideal sign, a time uh, for a, a visual piece of content yeah. rather than trying to make a, an avatar? Yeah. I think that the area where the industry has to improve dramatically is, is really the ergonomic of wearing this screen. It's not so much the immersive experience, uh, but it's just the, the fundamentals. Easy. Distribution of weight, uh, right. you know, like, like anything. Right. Uh, a chair, if it's uncomfortable, right. After a while, you say, why about that chair? It's right. fantastic design, but it's uncomfortable, right? right? right. right. Uh, and so here is going to happen exactly the same. The first step is just to make it happen so that you can experience what it is. And then right after, there will be perfecting so that you know, one is more comfortable than another one or more performing, you know, either as a vector of ergonomics uh, or a vector of quality. What is the eye quality? What, is, what do you think? Uh, the screen quality of what you're looking into, where does that have to be so that it really does feel like virtual reality as opposed yeah. to staring into a video screen yeah. that's on the inside of the mask? I mean, there are two aspects on, on, on your statement. One aspect is the quality of the resolution of the head mount display. Of course, uh, you're looking at the screen very close, so the resolution has to be very high and pixel density has to be very high in order to deliver uh, you know, a comfortable image that doesn't look like grainy or low resolution and, and so on. The other aspect is the production aspect, and that's why we step in with this professional camera, where virtual reality is not just putting a camera in a place uh, and walking away. I mean, even 2D cameras uh, would be very boring if you put a camera in any place uh, and there is no production around it, would be really boring. Uh, so the same for virtual reality. Yes. So you need to really envision the virtual reality experience and video production uh, as you do for you know, telling the story or even telling the story for a live event. Uh, even live event, uh, the production is very, very critical. We're going to do first this session and that, that session, and there's a commentator. I mean, this, this is all architected so that the show is fantastic. So the technology is there to get it done. Is there a whole workforce or a whole community that is going to come out of this that are going to be really thinking VR, not narrative storytelling? Yeah. I, I the think way uh, you know, it, it goes with the, with the level of specialization, right? So you have the fundamentals that need to be in place, uh, either it's DP or cameraman or, you know, and so on. And then you have those specialization of like people that are really good in underwater or people who are very good in uh, uh, you know, other, other verticals. And one, one of those is going to be people that are very good in VR because the, the rules and the techniques uh, and the tricks <laughs> and how you make it happen is different. It's not always different, uh, but it's different. Uh, lighting is a good point you touch, you know. Lighting, all, you know, sources are behind the camera, bouncing the light here and there. Sound. And suddenly sound is, you know, 50% of the experience. Uh, um, also, for example, has those uh, eight microphones, but if it's a real production, you're going to mic all your uh, actors. Uh, and then when you mix it, uh, again, the assumption that the viewer is in front of a screen uh, and all the speakers are around and is static uh, is 
wrong assumption. <laughs> the viewer is turning his head. Something has to happen with sound. When you, uh, when you walk into a studio and there's a, there's a meeting waiting for you at a conference <laughs> table of a lot of production people, what's the most common question you get or what is the co most common reaction you get? I mean, the reaction, and this was really interesting when we validate the market. So in the early stage, we have you know, the, the shape of the camera and we start engaging with uh, you know, professionals and studios and so on just to see how, how they react. And it was really fantastic to see that we were pulling out the camera and the form factor was fundamentally matching uh, what they imagined it could or should be. And, and suddenly they, they just, just love it. <laughs> Not love it because it's, it's so uh, well-functioning and so on, because at that stage they were not even trying it. Uh, but just the form factor was answering a lot of questions they had uh, in the way they thought it should be the way you answer it. And, and so that's, that's uh, how it was perceived, like right, right away, really, really well. How do you see this business rolling out over the next five or 10 years? Mm -hmm. I mean, is it, is it, are we at the very, very earliest stages or are we have further away along? Where are we in the curve and, and um, just how do you see next year, the year after, or five years from now? How do you think this plays yeah. out? We're really at the early stage. Now, the, the good news is, uh, is an early stage of very healthy. A lot of people are investing a lot of money. Um, and that, that money, if used appropriately, as many companies are doing, is creating the infrastructure to enjoy the product uh, more rapidly. Um, a lot of the roadblocks like uh, you know, computing uh, uh, efficiency, speed, uh, uh, the ergonomics of the headset, you know, look at how many companies are participating to the VR. Very big company with a lot of money a lot of startups uh, backed up with you know VC money or investor money, um, and and that really can create the momentum uh, where you know each of them is addressing one element of the ecosystem, uh, either is the content part uh, or the playback part or just the infrastructure to deliver it, uh, and and so you have all those ideas, uh, and because we're at an early stage, some of those ideas will be very successful, some will be very unsuccessful but they're beneficial to the industry because right. every mistake uh, is a learning for everybody else. Are there any cautions? Are there any um, things that you think, if you're talking to the VR community, what do we need to remember to make sure that we get this right? And is it not over-promising to the consumer? Yeah. Or, or what I is think, it? Yeah, I think that what we need really to remember is that the technology is great, right? But if the story that we're telling is boring and not interesting, uh, the technology will not be adapted. As you know, we learned many, many times uh, through the past, uh, is really engaging with the viewer, not as a technological challenge, uh, right. but as a telling the story, creating emotion. Uh, you know, we, o we used to say, I mean, we're still saying, uh, you know, I'll take you to places, or a movie will take you to places. Uh, and so VR can take you to places, but has to be interesting. If Once you're there, something has interesting to, exactly, has to happen. You know, if I'm in the middle of the forest uh, and nothing happened, I can turn around three times, maybe right. 30 seconds. Right. I give you a minute. Right. After a minute, I'm bored. Right. So it's really critical for the VR industry to focus on the technology aspect. Of course, you want resolution and all those elements. Uh, but when you deliver the experience or you want to somebody to try your gear, uh, make sure that you show something that you also feel interesting. Well, I know a great amount of your R&D is secret. <laughs> uh, and I know that Ozo is what we're talking about now. Right. But uh, when you can talk about more, and I know that you will in the next few months, Absolutely. please come back and share where you are and what you're seeing uh, well, in 2016. And yes. until then, great good luck with Ozo. It's a beautiful camera. And we're Fantastic. excited. Thank you. The Close-Up is produced by the Advanced Imaging Society in Hollywood and powered by Barcode.